Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! We begin, for the first time in a while, with Brexit and the... Well, the, the continuing insanity, actually. I don't, I don't think we're going to have any fights today because I don't think we're arguing with each other anymore. I, I've been saying for some time that, that people are eventually going to reach the point where they claim that they, they knew that they would be hurt and they're happy about it. I couldn't see how psychologically it could go anywhere else. Once reality began to bite and you realised that there wasn't going to be £350 million for the NHS and you realised that we always had the freedom to run our borders in a much more robust fashion and you learned that EU migrants are actually net contributors to the British society and you realised that things like housing and uh, school place stories had more to do with the incompetence of government and the greed of property developers than it did to do with the number of French or Polish people coming here. Once you realised that all of these very effective and powerful property propaganda tools were built largely on sand, you'd be left with two choices. You could admit either that you were wrong or that you were dishonest. Um, looking at the landscape of British media and politics, it's hard to imagine an era in which more unjustifiably inflated egos were invested on the side that has now been proved wrong. Does Boris Johnson strike you as a man who's going to stand up in public and say sorry? Ever? doesn't even say sorry to his wives when he cheats on them. Why the hell would he ever say sorry to you for lying about Brexit? Because you're a pleb, and he doesn't care about you. He cares only about getting into Downing Street, and he's 54 now. The clock is ticking. He's an old man in a hurry. That's why today much of the media will follow his lead and fall into the trap of talking about his latest fact-free bloviations instead of the fact that the former Foreign Secretary and the former Secretary of State for leaving the European Union are currently seeking to dominate the news agenda by explaining that despite having two years to bring about any of the promises they made, they failed completely to do so, but it's not remotely their fault. Cast your mind back two years when we were wondering on the programme why Theresa May was playing the hand that she was playing. Why did she give the biggest jobs in foreign policy and Brexit to arch, if you will, Brexiters, Brextremists, to be strictly accurate. Why did she do that? Boris Johnson, Liam Fox, David Davis, why did she do that? When the wisdom, if you will, of the brighter members of her cabinet would have been that we have to try to stop it, or we have to try to mitigate it, or we have to try at least to limit the damage that we're going to do to ourselves. So why did she give the jobs to those three? And the conclusion that we arrived at, a broad consensus, was that if they were right up against it, if they had their noses to the metal of Brexit reality, then a time would come when they had to admit that it was all going horribly wrong. And because they were on the inside of the tent, they would be unable to disassociate themselves from the disaster. Not like your sort of, you know, ten a penny fag packet fascists and newspaper columnists who are never going to have their hands on the tiller of anything so they can devote their lives to heckling and throwing rotten tomatoes from the sidelines. They can bleat about a, a narrative of betrayal because they've never actually been charged with delivering anything substantive. So I thought Theresa May, and I still, you'll allow me not to have a strong conclusion about this yet, because I still think she did the right thing, but it's backfired. I still don't see how else she could have done it. She had to give those three clowns really, really big jobs because that was the only way in which they could be prevented from sitting on the sidelines denying reality and bleating betrayal. So the only question then became how long will it take for reality to bite and what will happen when it does? Well, now we know. They run. They hide. They flee. And then they start throwing rotten tomatoes from the sidelines, claiming that they bear no responsibility whatsoever for the result of a government policy that they had a stronger hand in than almost anybody else. What will their little cheerleaders say? Oh, well, they weren't allowed to do this, or Theresa May was that, and Theresa May was Secretary of State for leaving the European Union. Michel Barnier on speed dial. Every opportunity in the world to explain to the voters what was going on. Seriously. What did David Davis do? Diddly squat. 
to coin a phrase employed by Boris Johnson today. Absolutely nothing. Go back to his tweets from before he got the job and you will find... He hasn't... He, do you know what? He's too arrogant even to delete it. Not, not to correct it. I'm pretty arrogant myself. I don't like deleting tweets when I make a mistake. I prefer to own it. Leave it up there with a, with a follow-up tweet saying, I got this wrong. But when he was saying that we'll be in Berlin, not Brussels, doing deals that we would be able to strike up our own free trade agreements with individual European Union members. The scale of his ignorance was, was Greek. It was Roman. It's the kind of thing that, you know... It's the kind of thing the playwrights of the ancient years would have said. That level of hubris. It's quite incredible to be that wrong about something so big while playing such an enormous role in promoting it. And two years later, instead of turning around and saying, oh, my God, I understood nothing. I, I genuinely understood nothing. I didn't realise that we wouldn't be able to trade with European Union countries unless we abided by the rules that they published 30 years ago. I had no idea that when Michel Barnier laid out his position, um, he was going to stick to it. It's almost as if the European Union is a club with membership rules, and we've decided not to be members anymore, but we want to make up our own rules and still be members. And I, I, amazingly, says David Davis, I don't think they're going to let us. But that would involve humility, modesty and intelligence. It would involve taking a step back from the mess and saying, oh, my giddy aunt, two years I've been in charge of this, and look at the almighty mess we've made. I don't see how it could have gone any differently, actually, because none of us really understood the scale of the task that we'd set ourselves. None of us really appreciated that we had encouraged 51% of the country to vote in favour of trying to get the eggs out of a baked cake. And guess what? It's really hard. David Davis can't do that. Too much ego. Too much investment, too much self-interest, too much vanity. Boris Johnson can't do that for pretty much the same reason squared. Who can do that? I don't know. And that brings us back to the people they've conned. That brings us back to the people at the heart of the LBC poll that's published today. 58% of Leave voters um, are happy to leave the EU, even if it means the NHS has to stop our medicines. Let's spend the 350 million quid on the NHS. That's why you voted for it, but now you're happy if we have to stop our medicines. More than half are happy to leave the EU, even if it means the UK going into recession. What do we want? We want to be poorer. When do we want it? Now. Only 51%, but still, anyone who listens to this programme on a regular basis will find these findings, these poll findings, grimly easy to believe. More than half are happy to leave the EU, even if it means the cost of food rising significantly. What do we want? More expensive food. When do we want it? Tomorrow. Stop piling medicines. Whole country in recession. Food rising significantly. 70% are happy to leave the EU, even if it means longer queues at ports and airports. What do we want? Really rubbish beginnings and ends to our holidays. When do we want it? Now. 69% are happy to leave the EU, even if it means flights becoming a lot more expensive. What do we want? Foreign holidays only for the liberal elite. Only the metropolitan elite with a few pounds in their pocket can afford to go on foreign holidays. When do we want it? Well, doesn't matter really, because I'm not going to be able to afford to go on holiday. One in ten believe that EU citizens living in the UK have to leave the country in order for a real Brexit. One in ten people essentially endorsing Nazi party policies. And full control of immigration and borders is the most important issue for leavers in what a real Brexit means. These poor, poor, poor souls think that somehow they're going to be afforded the ability to be cleverer than they have ever dreamt of being. They're going to be able to get to choose who can live and who can't live on their street. They see themselves in some sort of exceptional status whereby they are worth more than that nurse over the road who's French or that doctor up the street who's German, or that hard-working entrepreneur who's started his own business but happens to be from Poland. They somehow think they're worth more to Britain because of, I don't know, some monochrome accident of birth. And that, and that, that, that is what this poll is about. Remember, before, before the ballot, everything was going to be better. Everything was going to be better. Everything was going to be better. The NHS was going to be better. Our economy was going to be better. Our lives were going to be better. And now significant majorities of Leave voters are claiming that they will ha be happy when everything gets worse. I don't... I still don't quite get it. How can people be happy 
about a recession? How can people be happy about food prices going up? How can people who've argued with their tongues firmly in their cheek that Brexit was about poor people somehow wanting to improve their situations now argue with the tongue in their other cheek that actually rising food costs, a recession and the stockpiling of medicines are, are things that they can be happy about? And what do they get in return? Well, the only answer we've got, very simply at this point in proceedings, is this. Well, what's the requirement of my job? I mean, the requ I, I don't have to be very clever. I don't have to know that much. I do just have to be calm. <laughs> <laughs> That's one answer. The other, of course, is that you're allowed to be racist again. You're allowed to... That's it. What else is there? Oh, border controls. Do me a flavour. No one's read up on what the actual rules and regulations are. What do you get in return? I'm allowed to be racist in public again. And that's where the Brexit-Trump axis joins. And, and what's weird about it is that the people who get angriest when I point this out are the people who prove that it's true. What are, what are you looking for? You're happy that medicines are going up in price or going to be stockpiled. Another story about medicine in the newspapers today that it's, it's just too grim to, to believe. So you want a recession, you want the stockpiling of medicine, you want food prices to go up, you want longer queues at ports and airports, you want um, flights to become incredibly more expensive, you want... Some of you want, not a majority, thankfully, um, people to actually be deported. What do you get in return? Ah, oh, well, I'm allowed to be racist in public. Ah, well, I could be wrong. Hit the numbers, 03456060973 is the number that you need. Here, here's the question. I mean, how are we going to do this today? How do you examine something that is so, so heartbreakingly self-damaging? Do you believe the poll? I mean, are you someone that is looking forward to being poor up and, and, and seeing your children perhaps lose their jobs, seeing your food go up in price, seeing your hospital struggle to provide the medicine that poorly people need? And, and we haven't even touched on staffing levels in these industries. What is it that people get in return? 0345 And at what point do all the most simple of predictions that we make about what would happen next. What will happen next is the men that made it happen will run away and claim that it's all going wrong because of somebody else's fault. It's all somebody else's fault. What would a good Brexit look like at the moment? Why won't Jacob Rees-Mogg and David Davis and Boris Johnson as they throw brickbats at the Prime Minister explain what they would do differently? Nick tried to ask David Davis that earlier today. Didn't get an answer. Ah, and then underpinning it all, what is going on. 03456060973. What will happen next? 03456060973. And how can so many people still be surprised by the positions that the European Union has laid out and explained a gazillion times? Your thoughts after this. When does the finger of blame end up resting on the foreheads of the people that told us it would all go brilliantly? They've tried to blame everybody else. You don't believe enough. You don't believe enough. It's all Lily Allen's fault. You've got to believe in Brexit more. Brexit means Brexit. Um, who else has been blamed for it? The Remainers have been blamed for it. The House of Lords has been blamed for it. Universities have been blamed for it. The enemies of the people, um, or judges, as we prefer to call them, have been blamed for it. Just about everybody's been blamed for it going wrong, except the people that said it would go right. Theresa May never said it would go right, but now she's getting blamed for the fact that it's gone wrong by the people who said it would go right and have been in positions of genuine power for the last two years. And still the madness continues. Helen's in Dagenham. Helen, what's going on? Hi there, James. Um, let me start by saying I don't agree with what you say, very rarely, and I buy anything to you every morning without fail driving into work, which I'm doing at the moment. Yes, I must say, tell you, we went on a trip up the Thames yeah. yesterday, right the way down, right the way back again. James, you have never seen so many building cranes. You've never seen so much construction, so many new buildings, office buildings, the most incredible buildings. And seeing it from the terms, you see a site you don't see normally if you're driving along the road. I did it as well, We're oddly, weirdly, this We're weekend. Going into a slump. Did it from Tower, Tower Bridge to Richmond. Well, this is my opinion. But well, it's, it's not an opinion. It's true. There is a lot of construction being done by, by foreign investors for off-plan purchases who are increasingly from places like China and Russia. But why would they pick here if we're going into a slump? Because our proper... 
Well, well because they still... Well, the answer to that, Helen, is, is simple. It, I mean, it, it rests on the presumption of rational action. Increasingly, mm -hmm. these people are, I guess, waking up to the fact that we really are going to jump off this cliff, but they've been yeah. making investments and doing their, their deals on the presumption that we couldn't possibly be that stupid. And they, and they won't pull out now, will they? But that doesn't matter. There's, there's, I mean, every recession sees huge, huge um, quantities of empty office buildings. You know that, Helen. Yes, I do know there have been empty office buildings, and there's been slumps and depressions. And while we have been in the people East, have never. I don't. I can't remember a time. Can you remember a time when people have said, "I really want one"? Really want what? A recession. Oh, good God, no! Well, that's God. where we are now. In your opinion, or at least no, 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 not in my opinion. Fifty-one percent of of leavers polled. Yeah, it is only a poll. You, you can question the, 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 but I speak to these people, as you know, on a regular basis, and they yeah. insist they insist to me that they're quite happy being worse off. They knew that there'd be economic damage. They knew that their children might lose their jobs. They knew that there might be stockpiling of medicines. They knew that we might go into recession. They knew that they'd be paying more for their food. They knew there'd be much longer queues at ports and airports. Uh, they knew that flights would become a lot more expensive if they're allowed to fly at all. They knew all of this. No, possibly, because these people, similarly to me, have lived through the last 30, 40 years. We've had the most terrible financial crashes in this country. But we've never actively wanted one before. And the EU weren't there. We were in the EU, did they? And they didn't support us. What are you and talking got, about, Helen? What would you like the got, EU to have done in, in 1998? 1998 is what? Well, it's the last global financial crisis that affected every country in, in, in the world. Well, unfortunately, I'm old enough to remember the 1980s as well. Yes, so am I. Uh, where negative equity was the What would you like the Terrible European Union equity. to have done about negative equity? Problem. Terrible, terrible, terrible okay, problem. Helen. OK, and you know why negative equity happened? Go on. Well, I thought you were helping me out here because people were buying property with borrowed money that they couldn't afford. So when the tide, so when the tide went out, everything fell apart. So ringing in to say things must be going really well because there's loads of building going on built upon borrowed money and foreign investment. When the tide goes out, the point you rang in to say was evidence that Brexit wasn't going to be bad has ended up being the essential acid test of precisely why inflation of property prices has contributed to the economic meltdown that will follow if 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 it goes ahead if it goes ahead you're boris johnson fan are you helen huh? boris johnson fan i used to be till he built those stupid cycle lanes in the city okay 24 minutes after 10 colin is in camberley colin what would you like to say oh good morning james yeah i was just saying to your um your person there that uh, i'm off to slovenia this afternoon to work um this is a country that's totally dedicated to european union small country of a million people who just couldn't wait to join on the other hand the english in my opinion are the sort of people who will rather sink with what they got than swim with the change and to understand what's going on that's a bit of a generalization isn't, isn't it? it i mean you, you, I, I think i know what you I mean you're speaking about what we would call the the exceptionalist the English person who, for reasons that elude the rest of us, has somehow ended up thinking that they're intrinsically better than people from somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, I know it's a stereotype, but you can apply... No, no, you can, these people exist, but they're not, all, not, yeah. not every English person fits into that category. No, you, of course they don't. I am being very... I'm generalisation, you know, I'm making generalisation. Just a quick, a quick comment on, on the last call. Helen has been in touch as an architect to say there's a two-year lag for construction projects. In two years, there will be no cranes over London. So, again, you know, who needs experts? Carry on, Colin. What, what, what is it about the, the English exceptionalism that, for you, makes it less surprising than perhaps it is for other people listening, that 58% of leavers are happy to leave the EU even if we stockpile medicines, 51% even if there's a recession, 54% if food goes out. Going, what's on the other side of the scales? To, to be fair, we've been force-fed for the last, oh, I don't know, 15 years from, from Dacre, from um, Desmond, the Express, all these people have just been non-stop. Johnson... But, but the last caller, Helen, will, would, would probably take offence at being described as, as so easily manipulated, and yet she probably doesn't realise that she's ended up arguing for Brexit because we've survived disasters in the past. I mean, this is the bit that I find psychologically fascinating. How have people moved so effortlessly and so quickly from okay. saying it's all going to be brilliant to saying that, no, we should definitely carry on because we've survived disasters in the world? To, to, in the past, Theresa May said recently, it won't be the end of the world. Could you imagine if that had been the campaigning slogan? Vote Brexit, it won't be the end of the world. Brackets, probably. Jay, well, 
you're, you're preaching the converted here, James. I, I move around in Europe all the time, uh, and I was around before the single market. And I knew that, you know, if I flew to Dublin with some goods, I had to have the paperwork. Dublin, for heaven's sakes, you know. Single market came around in, what, 92, something like that? I was Yes, but there's cranes, there's cranes in Canary Wharf, Colin, so everything's going to be all right. Uh, have a good trip to Slovenia. Jerry's in Leon C. Jerry, what's going on? Hi, how you doing, James? Did, did, did um, she really say we survived two world wars, we can survive Brexit, or is someone yanking my chain on texts? <laughs> did I say it? No, did anyone say that on the programme today? It's incorrigible. I, I am incorrigible. It's sending me t t tweets that I think are supposed to be p p parodies rather than actual reports. But anyway, we digress. Why, why, did, why have you rung me from lovely Lee? Well, I think you're misinterpreting the poll. Wouldn't be the because... first time, Jerry. <laughs> I think what people are saying is that, yes, they're prepared to put up with a recession, with stockpiling of drugs, etc., etc., because Brexit will get them back to this romantic view of the British Empire when Britain ruled the waves. And it's all going to be Again, wonderful. you're casting them as idiots, and I know it's very hard well, not yes, to... Yesterday on the BBC, there was an interview with uh, Liam Fox's deputy, and he'd just been around the three countries in Africa that Theresa May went to. Yeah. And he was saying, it's going to be great, they love us, and we're going to do trade with them. Number one, they don't love us. The empire wasn't great, because he was talking about historical links. And the second thing is that those three countries add up to less than we export to Holland. Yeah. Now... No, and, and the deal that we signed was a cut-and-paste job on the deal that we already have, and that was cause for celebration. I, I, it's, it's, one, it's another one of those days, isn't it? You just sort of list all of the observable facts, everything that is evidentially true, yeah. Yeah. and you yeah. wonder how... And I suppose we should be grateful for people who ring in and say, well, I'm still cool because there's cranes in Canary Wharf, and you sort of think, OK, so that's, that's what you reach for now. I mean, what... So the, 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 the African deal is a cause for celebration because we've managed to hang on to all the stuff that we had as European Union members. Woohoo! What deal? What deal? We've come back and yeah, we've right, said actually. we will get rid of all the trade barriers and that Africa's growing and China's getting in there, but we're going to get in there and we're going to do all these great deals. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but, but you're talking day, the James, country you, down, mate. You, you're talking the country down, Jerry. Frankly, um, I, th I think you know it's all very well blaming Liam Fox and David Davis and Boris Johnson for the mess that we're in, and it's all very well them blaming Theresa May. I think it's your fault for talking the country down. <laughs> Look at that laughing. Typical metropolitan elite in Leon C. Yeah, you can, I can tell you've been holiday and you've come back wanting to wind people up, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you talk. How do you talk the country up? You say it's all going to be brilliant. No, There's exactly, bluebirds yeah. over the White Cliffs of Dover and cranes over Canary Wharf. Everything's going to be fine. And we're going to be here on Leon Sea waving our flags on the Thames Estuary as the British fl uh, fleet goes out to conquer the world. Rule Britannia. It's half past ten. Thank you, Jerry. 0345 6060973 is the number that you need. I think he's right, you know. It, I, I, I still, as in my own naive way, can't quite believe that people are sitting listening to this sort of polishing their gammon and, and thinking, no, I, I definitely do want a recession. They do see it as a passport to something else, a blue passport to something else. We will endure recession, expensive food, no foreign holidays, prohibitively expensive flights, massive queues at the borders, stockpiling of medicines, recession. We'll endure all of that because at the end of it, and Jacob has suggested 50 years would be a reasonable time at which to assess whether or not it's worked, um, didn't take him 50 years to open up two funds in Ireland, though, or at least the company he founded. At the end of that, everything will be, everything will be rosy. It's 10.31. So, so we've been quite lucky, really, if that's the right word, with our predictions on this programme. I don't think we've got anything wrong yet, actually, with regard to Brexit. And the men responsible for it running away while claiming that it going wrong is all somebody else's fault is the latest evidence of that. I didn't think it would be quite as bleak and stark as it has proved to be in the cases of Boris Johnson and David Davis. Um, I don't know what happens next. I mean, Boris Johnson's ambition is so complete that he really would rather be Prime Minister of a, of a smouldering dung heap than he would be a non-Prime Minister in a, in a triumphant and wonderful country. That, for me, has long been the essence of Brexit, actually, that, that weird prioritisation of accidents of birth 
or personal ambition over the national interest. So I, the analogy I used many, many moons ago, long before it became a reality, was to describe the arch Eurosceptic as someone who would rather be saluting an English captain on the bridge of a sinking ship than be a, um, a, a run-of-the-mill crew member on one of the finest vessels ever to float the seven seas, but with um, a mixture of different nationalities on the bridge and possibly on a rotating basis, uh, occasionally a German captain. That, 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 I think, works. I'm a big fan of analogies, as you know, because I think sometimes they, they cut through some of the complications of contemplating these kind of issues. So I think, you know, and if that describes you, it doesn't necessarily make you a, a bad person, but it makes you someone who wants to sink more than you want to be on a ship that's got a crew that perhaps is as multicultural and diverse as that that was on HMS Trafalgar. <laughs> you might want to look that up. It's a very sobering statistic. And, and that, I think, is, is where we are now. So Boris Johnson takes that to a ludicrous extreme. He would rather be prime minister of a country that he has personally and politically damaged, utterly unnecessarily, than never be prime minister in a country that's, that's doing all right, not thriving or booming, don't get me wrong. large number of Brexit votes were built upon the impact of austerity, the perception of, of people not having enough, not getting enough help. But now... People who encourage them to vote to leave the European Union are turning around to tell people who voted to leave the European Union because they thought they'd be better off out of it. Now they're telling them that they're going to be happy to see them worse off. And these, these are the days, aren't they? These are the days where you have to wonder why this, this, this programme has been such a rare example of sanity in a sea of nonsense. Because that, what I just said is just true. People who have spent the last two years explaining to me that, that other people voted to leave the European Union because they're really badly off and they think they'll be better off out, in my view, wrongly, but let's just park that view for the minute. This is the argument that they've received. They voted to leave the European Union because they thought they'd be better off out, whether personally better off or whether nationally better off to the tune of 350 million quid a week that we could give to the NHS. That's why they voted. This is what people, you just don't get it, do you, James? People voted to leave because they don't, they're not like you. They, they don't live in leafy suburbia. They don't, you know, they did this, that and the other. They don't go on foreign holidays. They, they, people are struggling to make ends meet and they're going to be better off out. That's why they voted out. Now, the same people today are saying, oh, you're going to be worse off. And I'm happy about that. And I just point it out, I just state it, simply. No one can fail to understand that. And then I just sit here looking all befuddled with my head in my hands again. How, how can that be? How can the people who said that they respect the leave vote of people who voted to be better off now say, in the same breath, that they're happy these people are going to have to endure a recession, pay more for their food, and see their medicines being stockpiled by the NHS? I, again, riddle me that. Catherine's in Manchester. Catherine, what would you like to say? Oh, hi, James. Thanks okay. for having me on. You're very welcome. Um, it was interesting, the poll today, mm. saying they're prepared for, you know, go to Armageddon. Not, not just prepared, happy. It's, it's quite, happy. It's, I mean, it's important <laughs> phraseology. I don't know who did it. I, I probably should, given that it was being done by LBC. But, but that word happy is crucial here. Yeah. Not, not just prepared, yeah. but happy. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, I can only talk anecdotally of talking to leavers in greater Manchester areas. Um, we've been going out and about talking to leavers for about a year. And I was at a street stall on Saturday in Reddish. Oh, yes. Which is a very... Just outside very, Stockport. Yeah, it's a very, very... You know, people there, they're struggling. They're really struggling. Yes. And they voted to leave. And I had a guy on the stall who was in tears saying to me, they said it was going to be easy. They said it was going to make my life better. It was just a big con. And he was in tears talking to us, saying, really? what can I do? Yeah. You know, a lot of people listening won't believe you. I'm not saying I don't, but I, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just representing them because balance. Yeah. Well, they don't believe anything they don't want to hear. That's very but true. They can, come out, they can come out with me any Saturday and go in, into these areas and talk to these people. This guy is on... Do you provide no. gammon sandwiches? <laughs> no, lots of cake. Oh, yeah. um, he's on a lot of medication. He's terrified. And then, and then now you need 58% of leave voters to tell him why they're happy that we might have yeah. to stockpile medicine. Happy yeah. to leave, even if it means stockpiling exactly. medicine. Happy to leave, even if there's a recession. Happy to leave, even if food goes up. I don't, I don't get it. Is, it. is it just stubbornness? I think it's almost become a little bit kind of... The more we give them facts, 
they just la 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 I just don't want to hear but these are people's lives they're messing with this guy said to me people are saying stockpile food I've barely got enough money this week to feed my family mm. how can I stockpile food and and he literally said to me and I thought this is a great line he said to me it's like PPI it was completely missold the con that's how I that might borrow Brexit. that that is Brexit in a nutshell it was and completely missold guy... you know if you buy a toaster <laughs> and, and you get it home, and what's in the box is very different to what was on the box. You can take it yeah. back and get a refund, yeah. but apparently the will of the toaster means yeah. that when it comes to Brexit, you can't do that. Yeah, A flipping toaster, right. Catherine. I can take I a know. toaster back to the shop and get a refund, but I can't change my mind about the biggest political decision this country arguably will take in my lifetime. Yeah, exactly. Happy and this days. guy, I just gave him a big hug, and I just said, I'm so sorry, and he... He left, he just said, I don't know what to do. I don't know what I can do. No, people's like, vote is gathering momentum. Some people, of course, yeah. claim, including Theresa May, claim that it would be a betrayal of democracy, which leads me to ask you this question, Catherine, because you're clearly mm -hmm. brighter than me. How can the people betray the people? It's interesting, that one, isn't it? And also, yes. I heard something, uh, what is it, a referendum can be democratic or irreversible. It can't be both. Well, I think there was a chap called David Davis, who obviously has now, <laughs> he's slunk off into well-deserved oblivion because it would be yeah. too humiliating for him to spend two years as Secretary of State for leaving the European Union and then turn around and say it's all gone horribly wrong, but it's not my fault. No one would be that base exactly. and pathetic. It, but it, he yeah. used to say a democracy ceases to be a democracy if voters can't change their minds. Indeed. And if it's going to be so great for Britain, then the people have can see that and go, yeah, great, we're still in. Catherine, I've got some good news for you. Go on. There are cranes on the skyline of London. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I, I also like the lady who rang in and said, yeah, it's a two-year lag on this. Yes, well, that was, a, that was a text. I'm no architect, um, but, but she is. 10.42 is the time. Uh, Tony is in Poulton Le Field. Poulton Le Field, actually, to give it its full Lancashire twang. What would you like to say, Tony? Yeah, hi, James. I think that uh, the government and the media are, are awfully guilty of refusing to discuss Brexit in almost <laughs> any other sense than economic. Right. So let's... Because I've never heard any conversations about sovereignty or borders. Have you? Not, well, in, in terms of um, percentages, I'd say we're talking 5%. Um, no, what happens? I, I, uh, let me explain what happens, Tony. What happens is you have you have conversations about observable facts, and that would involve things like economics and and laws, regulations, and rules. And then when all of those have fallen apart, what you have is people then go, yeah, but fish and passports and sovereignty. And the reason why perhaps you feel that not enough attention is paid to sovereignty is because you can't tell me what you mean by that word. Oh well, yeah, I think I can. Go on. Uh, and, uh, I, I'll, 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 I'll challenge you to listen to your own preamble. To no, 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 just tell me what sovereignty means. Well, sovereignty means long-term, and this is the important issue, long-term for the next hundred years or maybe longer, of sovereignty for this country, of not being part of or, or dictated to by a supranational government based in Brussels. <sighs> and so the white paper that said session, our parliament has always been sovereign, although it has not always seemed that way, that was an example of our parliament that you want to be more sovereign being wrong. I, I don't understand that. I think that's, I think that, I think that's just confusing. I, I don't, so I don't the Brexit that. white paper stated our parliament has always been sovereign. Yes, but we're moving towards a Europe where it won't no, be. No, we're not. And this is not my opinion. This is what I'm. Well, whose opinion is it then? That voted Brexit. Why are you ringing in with other people's people. opinions? What's your opinion? My opinion is um, neutral on the subject. I don't have a preference. So you found you found you found a Brexit radio show to be neutral, but explain other people's opinions. Why do you think they're not capable of doing it themselves? I think they have, and I think they base their opinions on a Brexit that gives us sovereignty for the next hundred years. They're not talking Our Parliament about has always been sovereign, although it has not always seemed that way. Brexit white paper, 2016 or 17, maybe. Forgive me well, for not you being... Can agree, you, you can agree so, with that statement, James. But, you, you but, but, but you're doing this thing, Tony, now. You're, you're ringing in, you're saying quite silly things, and you're saying that's not actually what I think. It's almost as if you're a Brexiter who is saying things that are untrue and then refusing to be held accountable for what you've actually said by claiming it was all somebody else's fault. So whose opinions do you think no. you're sharing if they're not your own? 
I think I'm observing other people's opinions, and when I observe yours, I can but, see... But these are opinions that you said don't get represented on the media. You just said no one ever talks about the things that you're claiming other people think. So where did you hear them talking about them if nobody ever gets a chance to talk about them because they're too busy talking about the economics, which was the point you rang in to make? Although that might have been a point that somebody else wanted to make, but you decided to ring in and make it on their behalf. Well, 5, five to 10% of the conversation openly discusses <sighs> those issues, and 95% yeah. of it, consistent with your own... Uh, preamble, your own introduction. Ninety-five yeah. percent of it was economics. If you take the if you take the premise, but these aren't your opinions. Just, Why should we listen to them? Well. Well, let's talk about your opinion. Your well, we, opinion we talk about little talk else, Tony. But why should we listen to you talk about opinions that aren't your own? Because I'm observing your opinions, and I believe that you're being particularly bullshit and trying to wind everybody up. Not at all, Tony. Jim. Just stupid people. Well, um, do you think I'm one of the stupid people then, James? I'll let the people because decide. I, I, it's 10.46. Say something stupid, have it pointed out that it's stupid, and then get really, really cross with the person who's made you realise just how stupid you are. Rinse and repeat until we actually leave the European Union, at which point everyone turns around and says, it's all gone really badly. I didn't think that was going to happen. Oh, I'm still very cross with that person who told me it would, though. And David Davis and Boris Johnson now proving, I mean, even to a degree that I find surprising, how accurate the prediction was that when reality began to bite, the architects of Brexit would run for the hills and start throwing blame at anybody else. Boris Johnson gets to the front page of the Daily Telegraph to do it. David Davis gets the run of the broadcasting studios. Hang on a minute, lads. You, you've been in the Cabinet. You've had two of the most senior roles um, in the country for the two years since Theresa May became Prime Minister. And you've done diddly squat. You've done nothing. You've muffed it up. You've demonstrated a quite astonishing ignorance of the simplest of issues and it's all going really really badly do you bear any responsibility whatsoever as a former secretary of state for leaving the european union and a former foreign secretary for the disastrous by your own analysis for the disastrous state of brexit do you bear any responsibility at all messrs johnson and davis absolutely not old boy <laughs> pass me a cigar guys in Cheltenham. guy what's going on hi james uh well, i hope you're a bit calmer now for this one but um the uh, thing I was bringing up was you talked about the lever statistics, the 58% and uh, not caring about a recession. 51% 51, 51 for the recession, 58% for the stockpiling. Measure. It's only a poll, but, um, it, but it, it, ta it tallies with a couple of the callers that we've had today. Yeah, no, and, I, and I think they've actually proved your point in a way. I mean, a, a caller rang in a few minutes ago and he mentioned about this Great Britain and how... We're uh, piling away, away, leaving Europe. And then your previous caller talked about sovereignty. I think half of the leavers fall into that category. And I think the other half of the leavers probably are vocational. We had the whole scallop war recently. And they said that 98% of fishermen voted to leave Europe because they want their seas back. And can you blame them? Yes, but but so that, there's, fewer there people, that, there's fewer people employed in the British fishing industry than are employed by Harrods. Oh, we, and I get that, and I get that, but I think every but trying, No, but we can't map 17 million people. I mean, I have a... I don't know how often you listen to the programme. I have a very cheeky and mischievous habit of, of saying that eventually anybody trying to argue that it's a good idea will, will just be shouting fish in a slightly unhinged voice from the, from the edge of the room. And I, I'm not accusing you of having done that. But when I point out to you that the fishing industry is a minuscule part of the British economy and that actually if we do leave the single market, it's going to be incredibly difficult for the, for the bulk of fish exports to make their way to continental Europe in the way that they currently do, it, yeah. it ceases to be a valid contribution, Guy. It just becomes yeah, the, the I, rhetoric I, I, of the pub bore going fish, fish. Fish, fish. And, and I didn't want to focus on fish. But you did, uh, well, I, because there's yeah, nothing I know, else. I use, I, I, no, no, I use that as an example, but you and I both know that there are hundreds of different industries that are all going to be separately impacted by Brexit. Some in favour, some against. Which, ones, which, ones are going to be, which ones are going to be positively impacted? <laughs> um, well... All right, now you put me on the spot. Well, uh, I haven't put you on the spot. You've just rung a national radio no, station. No, 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 and I know, and I know, and I've kind of had a bit of a side glance. I was going to say uh, on a, a big overall picture. But I've only asked you I questions think, about I what you've so said, too. Guy. No, and I agree with you. So what are, the, you. what are the sectors that are going to benefit from Brexit? I think very few. And well, go on, name a few. Financial. Okay, well, let's... I'm going to throw it out there. Possibly the financial industry. In some way, they might be hedging against Brexit. But they're going to, oh, no, that means it. a few investors might make a money by, by backing on a bad economic result for Britain. That's not, an, that's not a, a, a sector that benefits. That's one short-term no, 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 win. And, and you are right. You are right. I know. So, so let's try again. What are the sectors that are going to benefit from Brexit? <laughs> Very few. Well, let's name, and, let's and, name and, them. And Johnny, 
Johnny on the spot is, is finding it very hard. No, to do that. Johnny who rang in to defend Brexit by claiming that it would no, be no, good. No, 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 James, you missed. You. Okay, I've come across some because I'm not defending Brexit and I didn't vote in favour of it. I was just trying to. You're not going to do another. I'm, I'm sharing other people's opinions, no, not no, my no, own. No, 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 no. This is all my own opinion. <laughs> Go on. No, no. I, I, I'm literally. My rule opinion, I'm going to give you for Brexit. I'm standing here at Heathrow Airport now, and I had a chat with somebody over a drink a while back who was involved in financing the new terminals at Heathrow prior to the whole third runway this debate. And I said, how can you, how can you get the money to, to build these terminals when you don't even know if Heathrow is going to be the next major airport? And he said, the Chinese money, all the foreign investment was based upon a pre-required -re -pre deal that they knew that it was going to happen. And lo and behold, it's happened. Now, that might still be what I think is going to happen with Brexit. Europe has as much to lose as we do. It's not, it's not the ideal situation. I did vote to remain. But I think out of all of this will come some deal. Well, yes, um, but, but then now, you're, now you're sounding like Theresa May. You're saying it might not be the end of the world. No, no, no. It will be harsh. And when I say it's what's going to be better, you, we go back to you complaining about having ended up on the radio by accident. I haven't ended up on the radio by accident. <laughs> I, li <laughs> I literally, I was driving along on, on the M4. In your automobile. And I heard, and I heard your opening statement. Yes. And, it, and it, was, it was pretty grim listening to, and a lot of it, most of it, I agree with. But it's not, it's not, it's not my statement, it's the polling, it's the numbers, it's the, the, the thing I've been trying to explain to, to people who do inhabit an echo chamber and a bubble. I've been saying, no, you don't understand the next stage will to be claim, to claim that they actually want a recession. They will, and people look at me like I'm mad. I say, no, I promise you, they will be claiming that they want a recession. They're happy about losing their jobs. They're happy about paying more for food because, as the fellow in Lancashire who rang in to share other people's opinions with us demonstrated so perfectly, they think that sovereignty, despite not knowing what it means, is somehow more important than the price of eggs. Guy, have a good trip. Bon voyage. Ian is in Leeds. Ian, what would you like to say? Hi, yeah. Um, shortly after the uh, referendum result... Um I was speaking to uh, a relative of mine, actually my brother, who actually um, said he spoke to a number of people who voted leave yes. and said that they voted that way because they had nothing left to lose. Mm. And I wonder if that is the mentality of some people. Think, well, things are bad now. My job, is, my job isn't much cop. Um, you know, uh, I'm, I've walked my eyeball, eyeballs in debt. Uh, yes. Austerity is hitting hard, etc., etc. Well, if you leave the EU, it's not going to make any difference. No, and, and especially if you have been persuaded to believe that the reason why your circumstances are so straightened is all, is all down to foreigners and unemployed people. I, that, that was the beauty, really, for want of a better word, of the whole campaign, was the reason why your life is not... Because for, for right-wing voters to fall for it is actually really easy to understand, because the alternative is to believe that you voted for your own penury over successive elections, because you're one of those people who thinks one day you'll be on the right side of unfairness, so you're going to carry on voting for unfairness, because one day you'll be on the right side. You're still not on the right side of unfairness. Well, blame it all on Brussels and foreigners. Vote Brexit. Yeah. Does he realise now that he did actually have something to lose? Because I've had a couple of really daft tweets suggesting that you don't understand people who um, are leaving, that staying in the European Union wouldn't have made their situation any better. And that might well be true, but leaving it is going to make their situation worse, which is the point people seem determined to miss this morning. Yeah, well, here's the thing. I think some people um, are still believing that their lives are not going to be affected by this one way or another. Because they don't eat food or use medicines. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, good luck. good luck to them. And to be honest, they don't need aeroplanes because they can go everywhere by flying unicorn. Vanessa is in Wokingham. Vanessa, uh, short of time, what would you like to say? Uh, oh, just, just very briefly, um, I, I, I do think underlying everything is this sense of British exceptionalism. I get it's in English exceptionalism, Vanessa, because English. I don't know if you've seen the English. polls about Ireland and Scotland, but it no, looks no, no, like... Yeah, go on. Absolutely right. Sorry, it is English. Now, I've rung into you before, and I'm a huge fan, and you are my only safe space to listen to, oh, and I get a lot of balm listening <laughs> to you, because you're the only person who speaks any living sense. I'm very balmy, is what you're saying. <laughs> no, I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> um, but what I'm saying is, I mean, I'm an Anglo-Indian, grown up in a colonial... Uh, family uh, always been uh, England was home blah 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 but I have been here all my life since I was six years old and I have been told by one of my closest friends that I 
do not understand um, because yeah. I am not English. Yeah. And that was the bottom line. Now, I also listen in to the other side. I stick needles in my eyes and sure. I go into Farage, right? Oof. And it hurts. And yes. it says, all it's about, James, is we will fly our flag again. We will not be bossed around by Brussels. Oh, Mr. Juncker is not going to be half drunk and tell us what to do. I mean, it's insane. It's insulting. It hurts me that people listen to But it comforts process. your friend. Your friend somehow thinks that that is bomb. It appeals to their sense of the old British national empire, you know, as we're British, we'll manage, we'll get through this. And it's, it, I'm sure it's that. Yes, I, and, and that is why we're now reduced to listening to people tell us that it, it won't be that bad and after all we've got through recessions and world wars before when just two and a half years ago it was being described as the promised land, as the sunny uplands, as um, possessed of, of zero negatives and full-on positives. Everything is going to be great. And now it's not great, just like I told you would happen, they're trying to blame it on all the people who said it wouldn't be great. Quick glance in the rearview mirror. I had a little, um, a little look in the Independent Republic of Gamonia inbox during the break, and uh, if, if you're wondering what the flavour of comment from there is this morning, it, it is this: you pointing out how stupid it is to leave the European Union and making people who voted to leave the European Union look really stupid makes me even more determined to leave the European Union because I'm really stupid. I